Life of the sockeye salmon offers one of nature's most dramatic stories. Born in fresh inland waters, these salmon grow to maturity in the sea, then return to their birthplace to spawn and die. The sockeye is one of the five species of Pacific salmon. Our story concerns the life cycle of a sockeye soon to be born in this small stream which runs into Morris Lake, deep in the heart of British Columbia. Soon after these salmon return to the stream in which they were born, they seek a mate. And here we see the parents of the sockeye whose life cycle we will follow. The female has scooped out a pocket or nest in the gravel with powerful sweeps of her tail. This nest is from 18 to 24 inches deep, and here she deposits about 2,500 eggs. Immediately after the eggs have settled in the gravel, the male salmon fertilizes them with a milky white substance called milt. And in about 30 minutes, the eggs harden to protect the embryonic life within. After all the eggs have been laid and fertilized, the female covers them with gravel for protection. Normally, these eggs hatch within a period of 50 to 60 days in water that remains around 50 degrees. When one-third of the time required for hatching has passed, dark spots begin to appear in the eggs. This is the beginning of life for our sockeye salmon. When the eggs have hatched, the tiny fish are called sack fry. These fry remain in the gravel below the stream bed until they have absorbed the yolk in the egg sac which is attached to their bodies. When this food supply has ended, the young salmon work themselves upward through the gravel to seek food in the stream above. The fry leave the gravel in the early spring and follow the stream to where it empties into Morris Lake. Here they enter a vast new world of water to feed on its abundance of plankton and small insects. In this secluded lake, the majority of the young salmon spend a year, some of them two or three years, feeding and building up their strength. During their life in the lake, the small fry grow into fingerlings. In the spring, a mysterious force impels most of these fingerlings to migrate downstream. And our salmon, now a sturdy swimmer among thousands of others, starts his journey out of the lake. The Fraser and Skeena rivers, with their tributaries, reach hundreds of miles into the British Columbia wilderness. Starting from thousands of lakes and streams, Millions of salmon fingerlings use these watery highways in their springtime migration to the Pacific Ocean. Here, they disappear for a period of three to four years to feed on the abundance of small creatures that inhabit the ocean's depth. These young salmon have survived the many hazards of the long migration and now swim out through the mouth of the Skeena into the open sea. The beautiful city of Vancouver lies at the mouth of the Fraser River, the greatest single river fishery in the world. Prince Rupert is situated about 500 miles to the north, near the mouth of the Skeena River, the second most important salmon stream in British Columbia. Other rivers, such as the Nass, have large salmon runs, but the Fraser and Skeena are the highways from the sea for the vast schools of returning salmon, which after three or four years in salt water have reached their maturity. The all-powerful urge to perpetuate their species 
causes the salmon to leave the friendly ocean and fight their way upstream for hundreds of miles to the distant spawning grounds where they were born. The Fraser River run of Sockeye passes through the Straits of Juan de Fuca and into the Fraser River. Millions of Sockeye have used this river to return to their spawning grounds at the source waters of the Fraser, Thompson, Adams, and Chilco rivers. At Hell's Gate, gigantic rock slides almost wiped out entire races of salmon by preventing them from reaching the spawning ground. A man-made fishway now makes it possible for the salmon to pass around the turbulent waters at the narrow part of Hell's Gate. At Prince Rupert, a large fishing fleet is ready. And as soon as the salmon run is underway, the trollers, gill netters, and saners sail out to take their toll. The trollers work offshore, where thousands of sockeye are snared by the lures at the ends of the lines attached to the long poles. A saner stays in calm waters whenever possible, and with the use of nets, large numbers of salmon are caught as they pass through the channels on their way to the river's mouth. In some of the northern waters, it is legal to place traps in the path of the salmon schools, and these traps capture many tons of fish during the salmon run. All of the fish caught commercially are taken to the unloading docks at the nearest cannery. The high oil content and the color of their flesh, plus their almost uniform size, make the sockeye the most prized of all Pacific salmon. The salmon that escape these many hazards are met at the river's mouth by sports fishermen who use flashing spoons and lures to taunt them into striking at their hooks. As soon as the salmon enter the fresh water of the Skeena River, they stop feeding completely and live on the energy stored up during their life in the sea. As our sockeye passes a rocky ledge, a bear grabs for him but misses. But the next one is not so fortunate and the fish-eating bear catches the wriggling salmon and ambles slowly away to enjoy a feast. By the time the surviving salmon have reached the Bulkley River, certain physical changes have occurred. They have turned a bright red, and in their 200-mile fight upstream, many of them have been torn and bruised. In the eddies along the walls of the gorge below the Morristown Falls, the salmon rest for their struggle to overcome the last major obstacle on their way to the spawning ground. The survival of the fittest is demonstrated here in dramatic form as the valiant salmon leap and fight up the face of the falls in their effort to reach the pools above. Taking advantage of all natural aid, the salmon fight their way along the rocky edges to reach pools where they can rest. But many of them are caught by the force of the water and swept downstream. In addition to the natural hazards of rocks and waterfalls, the salmon must now escape being caught by the Indians who have fished here for centuries. The salmon reach the upper pools by a series of natural steps in the rock, and an Indian with watchful eye stands ready with his long gaffing pole. With a quick thrust and upward pull, he jerks the salmon into the air. Many of the fish are dashed to pieces on the rocks, but others, driven onward by the creative urge, continue the fight until they reach the river above, or, exhausted and bruised, rest in the eddies until they regain their strength for another attempt. Our sockeye has managed to survive all the hazards so far. And here he is, struggling against racing waters, 
in a supreme effort to reach the river above. With all his remaining strength, he bites upward and wins. In the safety of the pool above the falls, our sockeye rests for a while then once again swims against the current toward the distant hills and the stream in which he was born. That mysterious forest called the homing instinct has guided these sockeye salmon through hundreds of miles of salt and fresh water back to the small stream where they emerged from an egg. Our sockeye has spawned and thus reached the end of his natural cycle. For all species of Pacific salmon die after their first and only spawning. The greatest force among living things is the creative urge. And so in late summer, the sockeye returns to his native stream, there to spawn and die, that generations yet unborn may live.